Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for um, the most wonderful uh, introduction I've ever heard about myself. Uh, it almost like gave away the entire talk that I'm going to give, uh, which is great. It gives you foreshadows everything I'm going to say. But, um, but yeah, so thank you very much for having me here, and it's been wonderful uh, listening to all your wonderful projects and also get to hike a little bit while I was here. Um, uh, I, before I start the talk, I want to actually do a little bit of advertisement. As some of you might have heard, the University of Chicago will be hosting the next LSA Institute, which will take place next summer in July. And uh, uh, you should all come. It will be a, a marvelous occasion with lots of amazing uh, activities, courses, faculty, workshops, and lots of fun things, I'm sure, too. And um, Chicago is a wonderful place to spend summer in with Lots of water sports if you are uh, uh, looking for things to do, beaches, um, other things. And so please come. Um, the, uh, we have a website uh, um, which you should go visit uh, when you have a chance. And uh, the fellowship competition will be opening in a few months, I'm sure. So, OK, so I will stop my advertisement and move on. Hmm. There you go. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, variability in human speech processing. I'm interested in this issue primarily because I, as, as Andy points out, I am interested in the question of sound change, and I am interested in why sound change happened in particular. And so this, so in order to understand where I'm, what what I'm going to talk about uh, um, today. You might be interesting to you might be interested to know that you know what people have said about sound change uh, uh, in the past, and so I think I hope it is fair to to say that most leading theories of sound change presupposes that new variants are uh, come about uh, as a result of deviations that people have from their normal way of speaking or no normal way of speech perception, and so. Uh, a, a, a uh, most uh, um, widely cited uh, theories uh, of this sort is probably Ohala's uh, listener misperception view of sound change, who basically advocates a view that when listener fails to compensate for contextual vari uh, induced variation uh, in speech um, properly, these type of errors may lead to adjustments in perceptual and production norms, and these type of Adjustments could uh, are basically the the building blocks of change. Um, this type of theories, uh, this class of theories, there there are many different varieties of uh, this type of misperception based theory out there. Uh, so uh, Juliet Blevins evolutionary phonology uh, is another one. Uh, this class of theory basically assumes two th two uh, two things. One is that there is this thing, there is a normative mode of speech processing, and that there could be deviation from it. And those deviations are, are accidental. Um, and that when these type of accidental errors happened, they happened, even though they're accidental, they might nonetheless induce systematic change. And these are the, the backbone of theories of this sort. Um, a slight variant of this type of uh, uh, error-driven models of uh, uh, sound change uh, is um, uh, uh, the type of models that uh, people like Bjorn Lindblom has advocated in the past, which says basically that sound change occurs when individuals are engaging in different modes of listening. They are, uh, he, he divided up into the so-called how mode of listening versus the what mode of listening. So roughly speaking, the how mode of listening is you know, how speech are produced as opposed to the content, so like trying to understand the message as opposed to, uh, so if you're engaging the what mode of listening, you're trying to understand the message and not so much focus on the details of articulation. If you're engaging in the how mode of listening, you are doing the opposite. Um, obviously, uh, the questions you might ask about uh, this model is, 
why why such deviation occurs in the first place, but why would people switch modes of um, um, listening? And how would such deviation take place in a systematic enough way to give rise to, again, stable variance? Right? I'm, I'm primarily interested in this question of where do these stable variants come from? Um, and so uh, the research questions that I'm going to, uh, that, that kind of drives this line of work uh, are basically these. So uh, the first one is, is there only one mode of speech processing? To the extent that there isn't, uh, what are the different modes of processing, uh, speech processing, and do they vary uh, within individual? That is, is it, part, is it just like what Lindblom said, that we have the choice of engaging in one mode of processing sometimes and another mode of processing other times? And then finally, do they also vary across individuals? Uh, is it the case that uh, there are systematic differences uh, between you and me in terms of how we process uh, speech? Um, and so, uh, and if there are systematic variations uh, across individuals, how stable are they, right? So it kind of goes back to the within individual problem, like to the extent that there is within individual uh, variation, uh, is it also uh, pretty consistent and stable? And so I'm going to go through three case studies um, uh, illustrating the types of uh, variability that can occur. and uh, by so doing, uh, give you a sense of just how variable people can be, what type of variation can, uh, can occur, and also how stable and consistent people can or uh, might or might not be. Um, and so the first case study comes from a uh, uh, study of speech, uh, of pitch uh, perception. Uh, this is, the, this is uh, uh, work that I'm collaborating with Amanda Seidel at Purdue then they do at uh, the Max Planck Institute and Bob Blatt at uh, Edinburgh. And uh, this line of work came about as a result of work that Dan and Bob had done already in the past. Uh, and uh, their, they, the work basically um, uh, comes from their interest in understanding uh, variation across linguistically with, the, uh, with tones uh, in terms of why some populations have tones and other people, well, populations don't. But I'm not going to focus on that so much today. I'm going to focus on a, a slightly different uh, question, which is how we process pitch, uh, pitch uh, in the first place. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, so be, before I tell you what the phenomenon is, I'm just going to like, let you experience it. Uh, I'm going to play you uh, a set of stimuli. Uh, what I, uh, the, you're going to hear a, uh, uh, a pair of tones. And I want you to tell me whether the second tone is higher than the first. Okay. Um, uh, don't yell out your answer. I'm just going to like ask you to raise your hand uh, afterwards. So don't 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 like reveal your hand so quickly. So here's one. Okay. How many of you thought uh, the second tone is higher? How many lower? Okay. Uh, let me do another one. Um, how many of you thought it was the second one that is higher? Oh, it is fascinating. Uh, uh, yeah, it's possible. Um, so, okay, this is uh, not so interesting because you guys are all very homogeneous. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, so what, 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 what happened uh, is that I played you basically something like this, where uh, you were, uh, I, uh, each of the tone contains some set of harmonics. Uh, the harmonics is arranged in such a way that the top uh, harmonics are always identical across the two. But uh, the lower harmonics would differ in terms of uh, the the f zero. Uh, sorry, not f zero. The frequency. Um, and in the f in the first pair of uh, stimuli that you heard, the harmonics are going up. Um, in the second pair, the harmonics were going down. So most of you basically agree with what the harmonics are actually telling you. 
but supposedly there exist individuals. Uh, actually, uh, Natasha was uh, uh, brave enough to raise her hand to say that when she heard the first uh, set of stimuli, she heard it going down. And that is actually a possible answer because what uh, uh, if you thought that it was going down, that is, if you heard this and you thought that it was actually the pitch was actually going down, you are, you are engaging in a different type of pitch listening. Namely, you are reconstructing what the fundamental frequency ought to be. Right? So you're experiencing the fundamental as opposed to the harmonics even though the fundamental frequency was not actually, not actually present. So this phenomenon has been referred to as the missing fundamental listening or virtual pitch listening. Right? So, uh, so, um, uh, uh, so basically, the type of experiments, uh, the, the experiment that we actually did uh, uh, was uh, basically we asked, we presented uh, subject with a bunch of these sort of tone pairs. Um, the tone pairs uh, were different based uh, depending on whether they have um, uh, two or three harmonics, uh, whether the harmonics, uh, the ranking of the harmonics were, you know, right, right here you see three, four, five uh, versus five, four, five, six. Others were either higher or lower. Um, and also the frequency levels also differ. That is, what is the lowest, uh, what is this frequency? What is the lowest uh, harmonics? Um, uh, as I said, the top harmonics are always constant. Um, and the question, as I said, was uh, to ask whether the second tone was higher or lower. Yes? I just want to interrupt. I have the stimuli. Yeah, I, you, Andy apparently is one who you said you are mostly fundamental. I'm mostly fundamental. Yeah. Sorry. So such people exist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think for my phonetics class, it was split for 50 50. Yeah. So there's maybe something weird about that. Yeah. 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 Yeah pair-wise uh, stimuli, you always want to counterbalance the order. Uh, and so you have uh, the so-called AB order, and then you have the BA order, which for the same s pairs of tones, you will get different answers about up and down, right? So, um, OK. Uh, traditionally, people, uh, there are many ways of um, analyzing this type of responses. Uh, one type of uh, analysis that uh, Schneider has, came up, has come up with uh, is this called uh, the so-called uh, Schneider index, which basically takes the ratio uh, between the difference between the number uh, the uh, number of spectral response minus the number of fundamental response, uh, divided that by the number of the to total number of spectral and fundamental responses. Okay, so you get you get basically a number between one and minus one, or negative one, sorry, um, and uh, people who get uh, one are people who are completely spectral. That is, they are consistently, you know, uh, listening for the harmonics. If they have a ne uh, negative one uh, 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 Schneider index, then they are basically completely virtual. Okay. Um, and so, what they, what Schneider has found is that, by and large, uh, if you, so, he did a study looking at uh, a lot of uh, individuals. Uh, the non, uh, particularly she was, he was interested in comparing the musicians versus the non-musicians. The non-musicians are the white bar, and the non-musicians are basically pretty uh, normally distributed across the entire in, uh, spectrum of, um, uh, uh, but the musicians are kind of bimodally distributed. Some musicians are highly uh, uh, spectral and others are highly uh, uh, virtual. Uh, so, uh, so this is kind of the background. Uh, what we what we wanted to know uh, there are several questions that we we started this project with uh, that we want to answer. Uh, 
uh, which are not necessarily relevant to uh, the talk today, but uh, what, what we want to know is basically um, to, to what extent we can characterize the range of variation that occurs. Right? Um, uh, is it kind of just random, people just settle on a particular mode of listening, or is there something that kind of explains why those uh, variation occurs? Uh, and another reason why we're, we, we started this project in the first place was uh, Amanda and I were particularly interested in comparing people with, uh, with autism versus people who don't, uh, the so-called neurotypicals versus the autistic uh, uh, population. Uh, the idea be behind that is that uh, uh, people with autism are known to have uh, superior pitch perception uh, in general, not about missing fundamental per se, but pitch perception in general. And so we want to see whether uh, this type of virtual pitch uh, uh, perception might be uh, partly related to this uh, overall um, um, superior effect in uh, pitch processing. In any case, uh, so basically we ran uh, this uh, missing fundamental task on a bunch of uh, uh, people with ASD and a bunch of neurotypicals. Um, and uh, we also tested uh, uh, these people uh, or our participants uh, uh, on the hearing uh, for the ASD subjects. We, we tested them uh, on the ADOS2. For the neurotypicals, we tested, uh, we gave them the autism spectrum quotient, which gave uh, a rough um, characterization of the amount of autistic traits they might have. And then we tested the IQ as well as we asked them about their musical experiences. But it's by binary choice whether they have or have not. Um, and so this is roughly the dis this is the distribution that we got from our population. Uh, so about 100 people. By, uh, in this particular cohort, uh, it looks like there is a slight bias towards spectral listening. So you can see that the mass is basically all above zero, um, mostly above zero. Um, so then we can go back to the question, original question, which was who are the virtual pitch listeners and who are these virtual pitch listeners? That could uh, uh, help us ex explain some of the variation. Uh, mostly speaking, you know, the, we tested music, gender, IQ, and AQ, no, uh, no mean effect. Uh, there is an effect of age, uh, but this is uh, uh, slightly uh, problematic because age is kind of not normally distributed. So we kind of still, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how best to analyze this. But this is the pattern anyway. So. Uh, the, our age range goes from 70, uh, uh, go from 18 to 30, and so the slightly older people tend to be a little bit more virtual in this case. Uh, so that's the main uh, effect. Uh, not so interesting, I suppose. But if you break it down, you, if you break down the responses by the type of stimuli that they were responding to, then the pattern were, uh, is a bit more complicated. The first thing that you not we notice is that there is a difference in how people responded to stimuli that has three harmonics versus two. If you are if you are listening to stimuli that has three harmonics, uh, uh, the responses tend to be more spectral than uh, harmonics that are only uh, two. Uh, uh, the other uh, interesting uh, uh, finding uh, which has uh, Bob and Dan had already uh, noted before is that there seems to be a, a, a st really strong effect of how people responded to the stimuli. It's dependent on what the pitch, it, uh, what the harmonic pitches are. Um, that is, as you can see, the, uh, this is the standard index on the on the y-axis and the frequency level on the on the x-axis. Uh, what you see is that in the lower uh, frequencies, people were highly virtual. In the higher frequencies, they were highly spectral. So there's a flip-flop uh, in how people uh, engage in this sort of pitch listening. And so, so, are, so what are, uh, is it, are, are some of the factors that we looked at earlier, like musical training, AQ, IQ, and all those things, interacting with this type of uh, um, 
stimuli-specific uh, factors? And it turns out, yes. Um, uh, the first effect you can see here is that there is an age effect. Uh, uh, people who tend who are a bit older uh, are, are much uh, show much less um, flip flop than the younger ones. So the red line is the older uh, speaker, and the blue line are the younger speaker. And so um, uh, that's one. Uh, the AQ seems to also uh, uh, be explaining some of the variation, um, and so. The, the result seems to suggest that for the uh, individuals with high AQ, they, ex they exhibit uh, less of a frequency-based flip-flop than the low AQ individuals. Right? So if you compare the red line, which, is the, which shows the high AQ individuals, co compare that to the low AQ ones, which is in the blue line, you can see that there's a, the, the, the flip goes much higher. Um, uh, so here's another uh, uh, factor. Um, I, again, it's uh, we, uh, there's not uh, anything going on with music, no, nothing with IQ. Um, so um, gender, the gender effect uh, is borderline. So I'm not going to talk about that right now. But the the point being that uh, it looks like you know. Uh, uh, there, there, some of the variability across individuals in type of this type of uh, missing pitch, uh, missing fundamental processing, uh, can be explained by uh, some of these uh, individual variations uh, in terms of age, as well as uh, in terms of uh, their uh, autistic-like traits. Um, but I mean, th th this is still pre uh, pretty much a work in progress. We're still working on this, uh, trying to figure out how to un understand the data and how to explain the type of effect. But uh, the, the, so there are still a lot of open questions. So, uh, well, uh, are there other factors that, are, that, are, that could help us explain the differences between virtual versus uh, spectral listeners? As you can see that uh, whether someone is virtual or spectral is kind of dependent on other things like harmonics, uh, the, the, the na nature of the spectral composition, as well as uh, the frequencies. Um, and then what uh, the more interesting question would be, what, are, what other type of uh, speech phenomenon could uh, this be related to? Right? So uh, Dan and Bob, uh, Bob Ladd had uh, hypothesized that perhaps uh, variation in uh, tone learning could be partly explained by uh, maybe related to this type of uh, individual variability. Uh, in uh, uh, pitch processing, uh, that that work is still uh, to be done. Um, uh, we're we're running uh, uh, the same experiment in Hong Kong now to to see what tone speakers would do in this type of uh, cases because the existing literature basically focuses on German and English, um, and so we want to know uh, if you happen to already know a tone language, would you actually process this thing differently? Okay, so. Let me move on. The, the next case study um, has to do with, uh, so the first case study is kind of more auditory uh, uh, processing. We're moving on to the more speech-like, uh, more phonetic uh, things. Uh, and it has to do with co-articulation in particular. Um, here's an ex illustration of what co-articulation looks like. Um, uh, this is a, someone saying a sequence of uh, S followed by a vowel. The vowels are. Um, uh, R and U, uh, which is a rounded vowel. And what you can see is that uh, on the left, the, this S has a very different spectral characteristics than the second S, uh, even though quote, they are quote unquote the same S in, uh, phonemically. Uh, and that has to, the, sec, the, the reason why the second S look different, or acoustically are, they are different. Uh, it has to do with the, the fact that the following vowel t is different. The following vowel is much more rounded. Um, therefore, um, uh, that type of anticipatory rounding might be causing the preceding consonant to be to have slightly different spectral characteristics. What is interesting about uh, this type of co-articulation uh, uh, that is rampant in, uh, in speech production is that listeners are, uh, appear to be uh, 
uh, adjusting for them in perception. So what is what what is actually acoustically different? What are acoustically different are actually perceived by listeners as if they are similar. And you can illustrate this type of uh, uh, effect by uh, you know, a simple um, identification task like this one. The result is given here, uh, where you you create a, a continuum of uh, uh, sounds like S to SH, and you embed the continuum in different vocalic contexts. Uh, in this case, we embedded the continuum of S to SH in a context of A and U. We presented this to English subjects, and we asked the English subjects to basically, uh, when they listen to the syllable, tell us what the consonant is. Uh, and uh, the type of response you get uh, are the type uh, the, the, uh, the ones that are given here. On the red line, you have the R response. So you see that on, on one end, they are hearing a lot of S. And at some point, they start hearing a lot of shirts, which is what you get from uh, any sort of categorical perception experiment. But what is important is that the identification function differs depending on the vowel context. In this case, when the following vowel is U, the identification function shifted to the right, suggesting that, by and large, listeners are more likely to report an S in the U context than in the R context, which, which has always been reasoned as uh, the result of people compensating for the effect of the uh, rounding from the U. That is to say, if, if you are listening to something that is ambiguous between S and SH, and you know that the following vowel happens to be rounded, you might, uh, in doing the classification, you might think that maybe some of the rounding, some of the lowering acoustic, uh, lowering acoustic energy might uh, be attributed to the following vowel. Therefore, underlying that sound might actually be more like an S rather than a SH. And so this type of uh, perceptual adjustment um, um, has been reported uh, in, in many cases and is uh, robustly uh, replicated by many different uh, uh, research groups. What is interesting is that if you look at the individual subject's responses, you see a much more complicated picture. Uh, so here's just a subset of the uh, 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 subject's responses. What you see is that some subjects, uh, like subject 20 here, uh, exhibit large compensation effect. Whereas uh, just moving next door to subject 21, you, ha you see hardly any adjustments whatsoever. Uh, and so uh, my, uh, we, are, we are then in interested in just how, how to uh, conceptualize this type of variation across subjects. Right? In traditional uh, phonetic and psycholinguistic research, this type of variability are usually characterized as errors or noise or whatever. And your, your job as, uh, as an analyst is to get rid of them, or, uh, parse them out as much as possible, and find the main effect that you're interested in. I want to reverse the uh, strategy and say, to what extent we can actually find systematicity in the variation across individuals. Uh, so the first question that you might ask is, how do uh, listeners perceive or process uh, our, our co-articulated speech differently? Uh, we saw that there is variation, but uh, why are there variation? Uh, and the uh, and in particular, uh, uh, so uh, in this study that I'm going to talk about, uh, there are two two main goals. One is to figure out to what extent people are indeed uh, varying, uh, and second, to what extent they are consistent in how they vary uh, in perceptual compensation. That is. Uh, we want to have the same subject participate in two separate perceptual compensation tasks. And then we want to compare across tasks to see whether they are actually compensating at the same level across tasks. Right? This gives, gives you give, give us a sense of just how consistent uh, uh, in, uh, in how they compensate for co-articulated uh, in, information and how, um, how much they are compensating. Are they compensating the same amount across tasks, or are they varying across tasks? And so we, we, uh, we did uh, two tasks in this case, uh, a dedication task and a discrimination task. The identification task is exactly the same one that I already told you before. Um, 
And the discrimination task is a bit more complicated, which I'll explain in a moment. The experiment ran, uh, were, was run uh, in, in two populations. We ran a bunch of them in, in the lab, and we also ran it on Mechanical Turk. Um, partly uh, as, a, as, a, as a exercise of uh, cross-validation across subject pool. Uh, we want to know whether we can actually trust responses from Mechanical Turk, which is an online service for uh, getting um, um, uh, uh, test results from lots and lots of subjects uh, within a short period of time. Uh, and so uh, I already talked about the identification task, so I won't dwell on it. Here's the, here's the results. Uh, the, uh, the solid line indicates the R context. The dotted line indicates the U context. Uh, and you, you can see that uh, by, uh, you can see that the, the, the general pattern of uh, perceptual compensation is replicated. The two the two uh, subject pools uh, shows more or less the same results. Uh, so the uh, the internet based uh, subjects uh, were in blue. The I'm sorry, the internet based subjects uh, that is people on Mechanical Turk were in, uh, given in red, and the people from the lab are in blue, and they more or less overlap, uh, suggesting that, uh, well, whatever the Mechanical Turk, uh, Turkers are doing, they're not just doing things randomly, uh, which is great. Um, uh, here's the discrimination task. The discrimination task is a bit more complicated. The discrimination task uh, basically presents stimuli that are uh, basically a pair of syllables. The, the pairs always contain uh, an R and an U. Uh, what differs also are the consonants. The, the consonants uh, were drawn from a series of S to SH, a 10-step continuum of S to SH. And uh, they are either identical, that is, they are drawn from the same part of the continuum, or they are different by three steps along the continuum. Uh, and so I, I'll refer to the ones that are identical as catch trials and the ones that are different as discrimination trials. And we are mainly mo uh, interested in the discrimination trials. Um, uh, why is that? Because uh, for, for the uh, trials where the consonants are acoustically different, uh, we arrange the vowels in such a way that uh, it, induces, it, 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 cr it creates context where perceptual compensa compensations would enhance the difference between the two consonants, whereas in the, in the, other, con in the other arrangement, perceptual compensation would diminish the difference between the two consonants. Okay? Uh, so just to give you a sense of what that means, uh, I'm going to, again, play you sounds. Uh, uh, it's already the loudest, so um, here's one. Sound, shoe. Is it too loud now? Uh, one more time. Sound, shoe. Are they different or the same? And then here's another one. Shoe, shah. Are they different or the same? Shoe, How many say same? Okay. <laughs> well, you kind of, I'm kind of already like prime you to think that they're different, but this, uh, I mean, they are indeed different, but uh, for most uh, people, uh, if they're naive to the experiment, uh, they would think that uh, the second pair, the two consonants are more similar. And then this is indeed what we found, right? So if you, if you look at uh, the response patterns in terms of a uh, accuracy, uh, in the in the enhanced context, people are much more accurate in discerning the differences between consonants. But in the diminished context, they are much worse uh, at um, hearing the difference, which substantiate the, uh, that by and large, the population is engaging in perceptual compensation. Um, the two population, the lab-based population and the internet-based population, both shows perceptual compensation, but at a slightly different uh, level. Um, you can see that the uh, compensation effect is slightly weaker in the laboratory uh, con uh, laboratory cohort than the in the mechanical Turk cohort. 
Uh, but, but the main effect remains that, that, that there is an um, um, enhanced versus uh, diminished context effect. So now that we have the results from, the, from both experiments uh, and from the same subject, what we want to do is to correlate the, the responses from the two experiments. And, um, and this is what we found. Um, what you see here is the uh, compensation uh, response, uh, the, um, the magnitude of compensation in the, in the discrimination task in the x-axis, the identi identification task results on the y-axis. And what you see uh, is that, by and large, uh, uh, there is a lot more people in the middle where they're compensating uh, at a medium level. But there, there exist people who don't compensate very much. And there exist people who compensate a lot more. Okay, so it basically spans some sort of a continuum, uh, which already tells you something that, well, uh, there are variation across individuals in how they compensate, and the magnitudes that they, they, they the magnitude of compensation that they exhibit seems to be uh, relatively consistent across tasks. It's not the most robust correlation, I admit, but nonetheless, uh, there is a correlation. Um, and so uh, that's useful because it suggests that individuals do vary greatly in degrees of perceptual compensation, and that different listening strategies might be involved. Right? So uh, I, I should I should point out that, this, that the the observations that there are variations in people's perceptual compensation has already been uh, uh, noted by Bruno Rapp uh, back in the 80s. Uh, but in, that, in his study, uh, it turns out he was also looking at S uh, co-articulation from vowels, which is kind of uh, amazing. Um, uh, he also found that there are people who compensate a lot and people who don't. Um, uh, but he was looking at six subjects. So it was, uh, uh, this replicates the effect and shows that it is a much more, it's even more robust than uh, he might have thought. Um, uh, one th so you might wonder why is it the case that people seem to uh, engage in uh, different levels of perceptual compensation. One hypothesis uh, that we are toying around with is that, so, uh, that there might be different levels of information people are processing um, at. Um, so some people might be processing speech at a more allophonic level, in which case they are more context sensitive because you know in order to understand allophones you need to understand what the context is. Uh, while others might be processing speech at a more global level, maybe at a more phonemic level, which is more context independent. And so if you process at the phonemic level, then you don't pay attention to context. If you process at a allophonic level, you pay more attention to context. And that uh, resulted in different, way, different types of compensator compensatory responses. But then you might say, well, wait a minute. What, how, can you grow, uh, how can you make global statements about perceptual compensation based solely on one type of compensation, namely S, um, uh, the effect of vowels on S. Um, is it, could it be that uh, this number of uh, variability is feature specific? Maybe it's something unique about sibilance perception. And so uh, to answer that question, uh, we decided to look at a different domain of compens compensatory uh, effects. Uh, it has to do with uh, duration in this case. Uh, and this work is uh, joint work uh, uh, with uh, a former postdoc of mine, Hun Jung Lee, and uh, a current student, Jackson Lee. So uh, I'm going to go through a set of uh, 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 patterns uh, before I, I introduce the experiments. This is just to motivate why we're interested in this in the first place. Uh, there are several types of uh, effects, uh, as there are several types of um, information that could affect someone's perception, perception on duration. One is uh, pitch, right? Depending on whether the, uh, depending on the type of contours, pitch is overlaid on top of the, stick, uh, the stimuli that, is, that has the acoustic duration, you get different type of perceptual responses. We know, we, uh, before we go to the perception part, in the production, we already know that uh, rising pitches tend to take longer to realize than falling ones. 
right? So there's already a uh, directional uh, difference in terms of how, how they affect uh, duration realization. Uh, we also know typologically, uh, if, you, if a language has contour tones, they tend to occur more, if they occur on long vowels, they will also occur on short vowels. But if they occur only on short vowels, they might not, not they might, there's an implication of hierarchy in terms of the distribution of contour tones, right? That contour tones tend to occur on longer syllables rather than shorter ones. So, but if you look at perception, uh, listeners tend to judge uh, syllables with dynamic tones to be longer uh, than syllables that have flat uh, pitch contours. And there's also, uh, uh, and uh, rising pitch contours also tend to be rated as longer than falling ones. So we know that for, for stimuli that are identical in actual duration, they're experienced by listeners as if they're different based on the type of pitches that are overlaid on top of them. Uh, uh, in addition to dynamic pitch contours, the, the pitch level itself also has an effect. So in, in uh, description uh, and production studies, people have found that high, high pitch or high tone seems to pattern with shorter vowels and lower tones. Uh, so, uh, uh, the earlier studies by uh, Gander and Kong shows that uh, uh, vowels or syllables that have low tone tend to tend to have longer duration than syllables that have high tones. Um, uh, in Cantonese, uh, long vowels do not occur with obstruents uh, before obstruents with high tones, and that, that they do occur with low tones. Right. So same sort of syllable structure, but they're restricted to a certain type of tonal context. Uh, and similar uh, effect shows up in who which is a mon Khmer language. Now, look at that uh, from the perceptual side. What is interesting is that unlike the, the effects of dynamic pitch contour on duration, the, uh, if you look at pitch uh, height, the effect seems to be compensatory in the sense that acoustically identical um, stimuli, when they have a high tone, they are rated as longer than uh, than stimuli that have low tone. This is the opposite of the production pattern, right? In the production, high tone syllables tend to be shorter than low tone ones, but in perception, high tone syllables tend to be rated as longer than low tone ones, even though they are actually identical in physical duration. Okay, so this is uh, one, la one last thing about duration. In other types of uh, effects on duration comes from vowel height. Higher vowels are, uh, in production are, sh are shorter than long, uh, lower vowels. But in perception, just like uh, the effect of pitch height, higher vowels are perceived as longer than lower vowels, even though they might be identical in duration. Right? This is, these are effects that has been replicated in many different languages and different labs. So uh, obviously, the question here is, what is the nature of individual variability in duration perception? And so we ran an experiment where we present a subject with uh, pa p syllables, or pa b syllables, sorry, uh, overlay with different type of pitch contours, high, low, uh, high, low uh, level tones, and falling and rising tones. Uh, and then we also presented the stimuli in uh, five different durations, from short to long. And uh, and we ran this experiment on, in, in a lab and on Mechanical Turk again, but the results between the two cohorts are identical, so we're just going to report them as a group. Um, what the listeners were asked to do was to hear the stimuli and respond by indicating whether the stimuli falls along a line of 16 radio buttons, so creating a, some sort of a continuum. They have to basically judge where, where this, where they, what, what, um, how long is the stimulus that they just heard relative to some sort of standard? The standard that they're, they're trained on is a bare syllable that is uh, either 100 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds, which are the endpoints of the continuum. Okay. So they're, they're, they, they were trained on things that are extremely short and extremely long, and they are being asked to rate uh, test stimuli that are somewhere in between, acoustically speaking. 
And this is the result, uh, replicating uh, previous uh, study. Rising tone tend to be rated as longer than falling one. Uh, low tone tend to be rated as shorter than high tone, which is exactly what I said before. Um, we, this shows, uh, and then uh, this indicates that high vowels tend to be rated longer and long vowel uh, sh uh, than short vowel. Um, high vowels tend to be rated as longer than low vowels. Uh, what is interesting is that the effect of this type of uh, uh, compensatory responses, uh, uh, by and large, uh, are, are there regardless of what the physical duration of the stimulus. Right, so there's no ceiling effect, basically, what I'm trying to say. So now we, what we want to do is to look at the amount of uh, perceptual adjustments that people do for one type of stimuli versus another. Um, and so what you see here on the left, uh, on the y-axis, are the amount of perceptual adjustments relative between rising and falling tone on the on here, and this is between high versus low tone, so low level ones. And what uh, and you can see that if someone is adjusting for uh, the the effect of pitch height on duration a lot, they will also adjust a lot on the effect of contratone on syllable duration. Same thing if you don't adjust very much, you also, in one, in one sub of uh, uh, settings, you also don't uh, adjust it very much in the other setting. Okay? Um, in the, the effect, the correlation between, uh, there's a correlation between contratone adjustments as well as the vowel height adjustments, but the correlation is a lot less uh, robust. Um, and there is no correlation between uh, level tone adjustment versus uh, vowel height. Uh, so what that suggests to us is that in terms of within within the domain of the effect of pitch on vowel duration, there is stronger correlation in terms of how people adjust for them. But if you compare across um, uh, uh, features like pitch versus vowel, uh, the effect is less robust. The, the correlation is less robust. We also actually tested on the same set of subjects the effect of uh, vocalic uh, coarticulation on sibilants, so the task that we saw earlier. And we, again, did the correlation. And you see that uh, just like uh, uh, what uh, the, I mean, basically the, uh, the effect of vocalic uh, coarticulation on she, uh, that magnitude of uh, that type of compensatory response is, while it is significantly correlated with uh, pitch information, uh, the, the, the effect of pitch on duration, it is pretty weak. Uh, and same thing with uh, uh, between two vowels. Uh, the, uh, so this is about the uh, effect of vowel height on duration, and this is uh, uh, the effect of vowels on sibilant perception. Again, the effect is uh, unfortunately also pretty weak. So what can you conclude from this whole thing? Um, I would say that there is indeed great, great variability in perceptual compensation responses within and across individuals. Variability in perceptual compensation in one feature domain may not completely translate into variability in another. Uh, so there might be, uh, there seems to be some feature specificity. Um, the, uh, the part, partly the, re the, the, the difficulty in doing this above, uh, correlation is uh, how you create, you, how you, uh, what you are correlating in the first place. And there might be some room of financing there in terms of finding a better correlation or worse. Um, and, and what is interesting also is that some features might not be even be compensated uh, at all, just like the effect of contratones on duration, right? Uh, rising tones tend to be longer than falling ones, yet in, com in perception, rising, uh, a, a vowel that has a rising tone on it are also perceived as longer than falling ones. So they're not really doing perceptual compensation in those cases. Um, 
This suggests that perceptual compensation might not be a unified phenomenon uh, ex and, and might not uh, be explainable by a single mechanism because across different features, you get different type of responses. Um, variability in perceptual compensation might be partly driven by experiences, which I, I, I only want to leave it out as a, as a suggestion. I don't have to have evidence for you today. I have evidence elsewhere, but I don't have time to talk about it. Um, so let me conclude. Um, uh, what does this whole um, thing uh, mean? And how, 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 let's go back to the original question of sound change. I would say, you know, what is the implication? Well, we know, we can see that variation across individuals extend beyond traditional sociolinguistic dimensions to begin with. Things like age, gender, and sex, or, or dialect. We see that some cognitive differences may play a role in, uh, in shaping variation in speech, like autistic uh, traits. Um, individual variability, uh, individual cognitive variability, uh, I would argue, could be a precursor to sound change. That is, not so traditionally, people always rely on phonetic variability as a precursor to sound change. What I'm saying is that rather than relying on phonetic uh, variability uh, within the population, you might want to say that actually there are different individuals actually are, are processing speech differently and they come up with different types of production routines as a result. Uh, and this is, you might think of it as a variant of what Lindblom uh, said about different modes of listening, right? So some people listen in one way and other people listen in another. And to the extent, uh, uh, and uh, the notion of misperception might, uh, uh, might actually be more systematic than previously thought in the sense that you don't need to rely on accidental errors to come up with differences in perceptual compensation because what, is, what it turns out is that individuals actually differ already in terms of the magnitude of perceptual compensation that they're engaging in. And uh, to the extent that what, what I showed you today, which admittedly all has to do with speech perception and processing, to the extent that there is a correlation between perception and production, individual differences in cognitive processing may result in competing perceptual and production norms within a speech community. And this type of variation can be conceptualized as linguistic variation, right? Individuals speak differently uh, and perceive differently. And therefore, you have different variants that exist within a population already. And this type of uh, cross-individuals variability I would argue provides the linguistic resources needed for the construction linguistic styles. Uh, that is to say, you, you hear a bunch of variation from, uh, from your neighbors, and you can draw on those variations as potential source of uh, uh, identity construction. And, uh, and here comes the actual systematic systematicity in the sense that you have, you have a, a, a model to draw upon as a consistent source of variation. Like this person that you're drawing this feature from consistently uses or well, say things in a particular way. You don't need to rely on accidental misperception of your own as a source of model for stylistic construction, but rather you can rely on someone else's variation uh, as your model for uh, identity construction. And so just to give you a, a cartoon, this is, uh, I, I, I got this um, cartoon from I always forget his uh, first name. Murray is his last name. Robert Murray, is that what it is? The, the historical linguist. Basically, the idea is that, uh, his, his, his idea is that change propagation happens when, when you have a bunch of people uh, who had participated in some sort of change surrounding people who haven't done it yet. And so if this person is being surrounded by people who has already undergone some sort of change, this person might eventually change as well. What I would say here is that maybe it's, it might not be an accident that this person is being surrounded by these people. These people might actually be the, the non-compensators, and these people might be the compensators. I, I, may, I have no proof of that at the moment, uh, but for those who are interested in sociolinguistics and anthropological research, you might want to test this. Um, 
So I'll stop here. Um, these are the collaborators and students who helped out with all the experiments that we did. Thanks. <laughs>